The goal in your life is not to figure out how to be comfortable in your mental prisons, but to realize that you have the keys to set yourself free. Hey everybody, welcome to How To Be Mesmerizing. It's Tim Schur and today I have um, an amazing guest. I am so excited. Scott McCain is with us. Scott, woo! Yes! <laughs> Scott. Tim, thanks. I am so excited to be with you. Thank you for having me. I, I, I don't know about the mesmerizing part, but I'll, I'll, I'll try, to, I'll try oh, to rise to that standard uh, during our time together today. Thank you. Well, yeah, well, thank you. So let me give you a little background, right? Yeah. So I always have I always have these world-class, amazing speakers. And for everybody listening, Scott is definitely that guy. He is uh, uh, in the Hall of Fame, you know, as a speaker. He's in the Hall of Fame for the sales and marketing, uh, you know, uh, group as well, which is pretty spectacular to be in both. He's written uh, some pretty amazing books that we're going to talk about so that uh, you can get a copy and use it because his, his ideas on how to have distinction you know, and how distinction separates you from the pack, right? And how to be iconic. And iconic is one of his, his better books that, um, which they're all great, but this one Forbes put on their top 10 best business books list, which is a pretty big deal. It's hard to get on that list. And so we'll talk about that in a minute. But even more exciting is Scott's originally from Indiana. And so when I started speaking about 10 years ago, Every time I would go speak or I would go talk to somebody or I would do a TV show or do an interview or something, someone would inevitably say, hey, do you know Scott McCain? <laughs> <laughs> and, and so began the legend, the myth of uh -oh. who is this Scott guy <laughs> from Indiana, right? Who is just like, you know, so I've been, so for 10 years, I've been like, who is, who is Scott? Who is Scott? And, is and trying to reach guy, out yeah. and trying to chase you down because Scott's like, all fancy international global success guy now, right? And so it's really, really hard to get a hold of this guy. So I really appreciate that you uh, made time to be on the program, Scott. That's Tim, awesome. It, it's my privilege. I, I, I'm honored that you would ask it. It's great to finally connect. And, and I, I truly, truly appreciate this, this opportunity. And uh, gosh, I'm, I'm I, I, I like talking about other companies and other businesses. I have a really rough time hearing that about myself. So I, I, I'm truly grateful for your kindness. I, I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Well, absolutely. And so you get all that humbleness that came from, from growing up in Indiana. See? So, <laughs> so Crothersville, we, my hometown. <laughs> Crothersville. Shout out to Crothersville. That's you right. Bet, so, you betcha. Uh, <laughs> that's awesome. So, okay. Now, uh, so let's dive in a little bit. One of the ways that we stand out is we find something, right? And something that, that we can use to grab onto. And, and so for me, I'm using the word mesmerizing and teaching people how to be mesmerizing leaders and and for you, you have found distinctions, right? Things that separate um, people from the rest. And you've learned how to bring that out, whether it comes to leadership or sales or marketing or customer service and creating the customer experience instead of customer and, and making a distinction between customer service and, and customer satisfaction or the experience. So, right. and then you built a book around it called Iconic, which is amazing. So, so why don't you describe real quick what you mean by distinctions? And then how you came up with that? Well, you know, it's, uh, Tim, in all candor, part of what happened was uh, I, I had been very fortunate to build, uh, you know, a good career as a speaker when I was there in Indiana. And uh, my wife had taken a job here out west. And so we moved out west for a while to follow her job because, you know, you can live anywhere and do what we do. And, and uh, sadly, she was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. And so I kind of left the speaking business for a while to, to be her caregiver. And after she passed away, you know, my calendar was empty. I had seven figures of healthcare bills. I, it just was a really difficult and an empty calendar. And so I, I started calling speakers bureaus and I would ask the speakers bureaus, when you recommend me, what, what do you say? Right. I mean, what, what do you say when you're trying to get me booked for a speech? And they said a good speaker and a nice guy, which was about as, non-mesmerizing <laughs> as anything you can imagine, right? I mean, hey, I want to be a good speaker. I, I want to be a nice guy. But I, I realized that's not what our clients would, would buy. Right. And 
I, I promise the end of the story, it relates to every business, not just the speaking business. But, but I started thinking, okay, so how do I stand out? How do, how do I develop something that would make me stand out from the competition? I didn't want to be just different because part of what I, I realized was if you slap every customer in the face, you're different. Mm. <laughs> it doesn't mean they'll ever come back and do more business, but they go, oh, that guy's really. So it's, it's about meaningful differentiation. And, and that's where I started thinking of the term distinction. And then the blinding flash, the obvious was, gee, if I'm having a hard time finding out about how to do this, maybe there are other groups out there that are searching for the same thing. And that's when I got serious about really researching it and speaking about it. And that was about 10 years ago. And, and it's been the best 10 years of my career. I've been so fortunate. But, but it is trying to figure out what does it take to stand out in your respective marketplace. The only reason somebody becomes a customer or client is not just because they choose us, it's because they choose us instead of the other alternatives that are out there in the marketplace. So what do we do so that we become the alternative of choice? How do we stand out from the competition? That's what I started researching and, and what I realized is, you know, this, this applies over a broad range of whether it's, you know, the salesperson that wants you to choose them to buy from, or you want a promotion, why would the boss choose you? or you want another job, why would they choose you instead of the other applicants? Your kid applies to college, why would they select your, your kid as opposed to the other students that are applying? So all of that relates to the importance of standing out in our respective marketplace. And, and that's what I got really excited about and have, have been speaking about and studying for the last decade or so. Yeah, so with all of that research, are there a couple of, um, you know, looking back, because we do lots of research, then we go talk about it, and then it kind of gets refined, right, as we get yeah. a little older and we go through it again. So as you sift through all of that stuff that you've put out there at this point in your career right now, what are a couple of golden nuggets that you've taken away from it that you think are really, uh, you know, That's the a most great exciting? question. The surprising thing to me, uh, one of them, but the, the one that really jumped out when you said that, is that we have such a lack of clarity about who we are and what we do. And we're not nearly as clear as what we assume that we are. Yeah. Uh, good. <laughs> what, when I was first starting out in speaking, you know, I, I, I had been fortunate there in Indiana to be the state FFA president when I was a freshman in college. And I took a year off college to travel and speak for FFA. And then I got elected to the national office, took another year out to travel and speak for that. And so because of giving a thousand free speeches as part of my FFA duties, I, I developed the mechanics of what you do on the stage, but I had no clarity about what to speak about. And so the first part of my speaking career was I could deliver a decent speech. What did you want it to be about? You know, about an hour. Great. I can do that. <laughs> I would, I'd talk about anything. It didn't matter. And I, and I could do it fairly dynamically, hopefully. And, and, but I, got, I, I wasn't known for anything because I didn't have clarity other than I could get up and talk. And yes. as I work with small businesses, uh, with, with a program we have called the Ultimate Business Summit, it's focused for small businesses. Uh, I've been so privileged to work for companies ranging from you know, Volkswagen to Apple to Cisco to BMW. And, and it's really interesting that every organization needs to fine tune its clarity. Uh, what, what do you do? Why do you do it? How, what makes you stand out from the competition? So if there's any place that we could all begin, I, I think that's a great place to start is to, to refine your precision. But see, part of the problem, Tim, is that we think if we, you know, reduce our clarity, you know, we get it more basic, it means we're going to exclude some potential customers. Uh -huh. And that was my problem early in, in, in my speaking business was I thought, gosh, of course, I'll speak about time management. There might be some customers there. Of course, I'll speak. So I got known for nothing, yeah. which meant that in my, in my effort to be a mile wide, I was an inch deep. And, and we want to do business with specialists. We want to do business with people that focus on something, just like you're focusing on how to be a mesmerizing leader, that it gives that anchor that people know and can refer what we talk about. That is so good. I mean, that is just so, so good because you're absolutely right. There's All right, so let me break this down because there were so many great points that you brought up. First of all, we're never as clear as we think we are, <laughs> right? You got you to gotta find out how clear you are by asking your customers, right? And by asking other people because we have our own biases, you know, and, and part of being mesmerizing is understanding your unconscious beliefs and biases. And, and so that's what I've found because my model was Tony Robbins, which was a terrible model for so many coaches out there because 
he kind of does everything and, and houses it under personal development. And so we try to do that mostly because of what you said, we're afraid we're going to lose business, right? But also because we want to help everybody, right? Sure. But you, you can't fish the ocean. And so, so just like you said, you know, ch figure out, I like how you said, um, how did you say that a mile wide and an inch deep? <laughs> or something yeah, like right. I mean, that, that, yeah. that was my, that was my expertise. You know, I, I, I knew a little bit about a lot of things I could, yeah. uh, you know, I, and, and that, that limited my ability to help as much as I wanted to sincerely wanted to help. Yeah. It limited my ability because you, you can't be, you can't develop expertise on everything. And right. so if a company comes to me about, you know, a particular topic, let, let's say, you know, our people are dealing with a lot of stress. Mm -hmm. I have other people I, I know do a better job at that than I do. And, you know, the other thing that I've found is that when you are willing to say, I don't do that, it gains you a lot of credibility when you say, oh, now that's, that's in my wheelhouse. I, I do that. Yes. And we, we often miss that, I think, in, in business. Again, that's really good because I really don't hear most people say, no, we don't really do that because people are trying to just take whatever they can. And yeah. so I, you're right. It does lend a lot of credibility if somebody says, no, that's not, that's not my strength. I have someone I can refer to. Uh, free refer you to because then when you say this is my strength they're going to be like wow okay they're really going to believe you yes so yeah that's powerful stuff so um so do you have some examples of some ways that people have made these distinctions so that they were able to separate themselves from other people you know there there, there are several uh, there's one that when you just said that came to mind and it's it's one that uh, you and I are very familiar with given our uh, central indiana uh, connections and that's right there in Indianapolis. So one of the case studies that I use in Iconic is St. Elmo's Steakhouse. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, if, and if you haven't been there, uh, for those you know, listening and watching, if you haven't been there, it's, it, it is a must uh, on your stop in Indianapolis. And, and one of the things that I love about St. Elmo's and, and the Hughes family that, uh, that, that runs it is that they, they are very clear on what they are. You know, they are an old-fashioned steakhouse. Uh, yeah. with all of the trends and everything in food that they could have chased, they stuck to the core of what they do. And it's like getting tomato juice to start the meal. Why do you do that? Because it's what we do. You know, they're really clear about it. The, uh, the shrimp cocktail sauce that will knock you for a loop. Uh, it, oh, you, Tim, you should have been here. We, we hosted the Christmas party for the National Speakers Association chapter of Las Vegas. And so I ordered... St. Elmo shrimp cocktail sauce oh and put it by shrimp. And these poor folks from Vegas had never had any before. And I, we'd see them just dip this great big thing and put it in their mouth and then just go crazy. And, oh, my sinus is hurt already. Oh, yeah, you bet. It just became, and for those that don't know, it is laden with horseradish. It is absolutely fabulous, but you got to be prepared because it's yeah. amazing. So, and, and what, what that does, yeah, our, our friend Jay Bear has a book called Talk Triggers. And that's kind of their talk trigger. Here we are talking about you know, the, the shrimp cocktail sauce, yeah. but they, they have stayed the course. And the fact is, and I, I didn't realize this having been in Indianapolis for so long, uh, depending on what year you look at, they're either the 13th to 15th highest revenue restaurant in, in the country. They're wow. higher than Tavern on the Green in New York City. They're higher than many of these, you know, wildly famous uh, uh, New York City, Los Angeles, San Francisco restaurants. And it's simply because they are so distinctive of what they do. And, and all the other steakhouses, think of all the other steakhouses that are downtown Indy right now that surround them. And it's, it's still not St. Elmo's. They are so unique in their approach. Um, when I was Craig Hughes, it's the, uh, the, the CEO. Uh, when I was talking to him before uh, about, about the book Iconic, uh, one of the things he mentioned was, too, part of what they do is if you're a waiter there, they don't treat it like it's your part-time gig or your college. It, it, it's a profession. It's a career. They get business cards for all of their waiters. They, they give them a bottle of wine every year on the year that they started working there. So wow. it's, it's not just what you do externally uh, with, with customers. It's what you do internally with your team so that they get the clarity of, of what you're about. If, if your employees aren't clear, then there's no way your customers are going to be clear. But the Retail Marketing Federation released a study a while back, and it said about 70% of frontline people cannot answer this simple question, why should I buy from you instead of the competition? Mm -hmm. 
if our own people can't answer that, right. then we need to rethink what we're doing in our market. Maybe, maybe we need to be marketing internally as leaders uh, to get people on our team to get this before we go out to the world and, and do it externally. So those are the kinds of things that happen in, in, in terms of, you know, individuals and careers. Gosh, uh, there, there's a good friend of mine, Jack Miller, who's the CEO of the uh, Scottsdale Princess, Fairmont Scottsdale Princess Resort. And he's, he's another case study in the book, Iconic. And part of what he did is, he, let's, let's take offense. Let's, let's play offense. We, let's not worry about what Four Seasons is doing. Let's not worry about what the Phoenician is doing. What can we do to, to play offense? And so they decided they were going to own Christmas in Phoenix. That mm. When you thought of Christmas, you were going to think of the Scottsdale Princess. And it, it's just remarkable. And interestingly enough, that was one of their low occupancy times because there are no meetings going on during the Christmas holidays and, and people from Phoenix would typically go back to Indiana, you know, to visit family. And, and now it's one of their highest occupancy times because they created, it's, it's Disney-esque. It is absolutely amazing to go there uh, and, and see what's going on there at, at, at the holidays. Millions of lights, an outdoor skating rink, uh, it, on and on and on. It's just fantastic. And Jack created that with, with the vision of, what does it take to set ourselves apart? Because no one is loyal to a generic. If we just keep doing what everybody else is doing, then, then why would anybody choose us? Why would anybody be loyal to us? So that both Jack individually and St. Elmo's organizationally have found just amazing ways to stand out in their, in their marketplace. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, I think so many companies struggle. They don't want to become a commodity, but they just don't know how to be different. So they kind of ask the same set of questions over and over of what makes us different. What's, you know, let's look at um, our competition and what are they doing? How do we differ? How are we similar? You know, in, in one of your books, you wrote that uh, so many motivational books talk and business books talk about how to have a positive attitude, but sometimes you need to go negative. What do you, what do you mean by that? I appreciate you asking because that, that is one that uh, stirred up a little bit of controversy and, and uh, I, I enjoy talking about it. I, I think a lot of times we confuse having a positive approach with um, ignoring reality. Uh, we don't mean to do that, but I, I, I have worked in and worked with organizations that if I brought or if another employee brought a negative situation to the boss, we were considered to be a negative employee when in fact we were trying to fix what was broken. And, and so what I found in the research was that iconic organizations aren't afraid of the negative. In other words, what happens is many times if we have a customer that's disappointed, we do what it takes to placate that customer. Oh, here's $20 off or here's, you know, 500 points in your frequent flyer account or here's, you know, so that the customer goes away happy. But we don't go negative enough to find out what's wrong with the process that created that dissatisfied customer to begin with. A study at the Texas A&M University found that in SWOT analysis, you know, the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats, analysis that some organizations go through, that they were so afraid of negativity that what was wrong, a weakness, was perceived to be an opportunity. In other words, if they had bad brand image, uh, well, that's an opportunity. We can make our brand image better. No, it's a weakness. And so you have to really go negative and explore why do we not have a good brand image? And it's, it's I call it positive negativity. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it is exploring, not being afraid to go negative so that we can fix it so it turns into something positive. That is well said. And I think that the reason that companies are afraid of that, some companies, is because they, um, they think that it's going to spread, right? Yeah. Or, that they're, or they're not going to really, they don't want to fix it. Or they think it's going to be too expensive, so they don't want people to keep bringing it up. Remember, I was doing a team huddle one time and, uh, and I had a bunch of uh, sales reps and we were in a circle and I said, today we're going to talk about one thing that's been upsetting you so you can get it off your chest. I'll give you some reframes and different ways of looking at it, but we're going to be able to just talk about it. And then through that, maybe identify some of the problems that we have so that we can start to look at how are we going to solve this, right? And so, and, uh, and it went really well. And people afterwards said they felt so much better and it was very constructive. Well, then I was doing a follow-up team meeting with a group of managers, and one of the managers in the sales meeting he, that was there, uh, he opened up and said, I just wanted to beat you. <laughs> he literally said that. <laughs> he said, I just wanted to pick you up and beat you. With <laughs> oh, man. And I'm like, why? And he said, because that just turns into 
you know, um, an itch fest, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? Where everybody's itching about everything and complaining about everything. And, and, uh, and that let me know that he shut down when people were, if he thought that venting was being negative, that he yeah. was shutting people down and he was losing a, a lot of opportunities because people weren't feeling like they were being heard. So they just stifled it. You know, and I found that part of that, not, not, not all of that, but part of that is out of our confidence as a leader, which is why what you're doing is so important with, with leaders. Um, Michael Jordan had a coach that was on his tail every day. He wanted to be coached. Why? Because confident, professionals want to get better and you, you get part of how you get better is somebody, you know, coaching you on what you're doing wrong and how you can fix it. And I, I sometimes see leaders who either aren't confident enough uh, to, to have that happen, or they think I'm going to be on to my j next job in, you know, X number of months or in a year. So if we can just hang on and I can paper over this, then I'll be gone and somebody else can fix it. And when that happens in an organization, that's, that's really challenging and difficult. A few years back, I was on a program and Colin Powell was the other speaker. And he had this very dramatic story about, you know, uh, Gorbachev sitting across from Reagan and, and he's sitting next to President Reagan and Gorbachev leans over the table and he says, do you understand what I'm telling you? The world has changed. The Cold War is over. We're not going to be in the Cold War anymore. And Colin Powell said, and my first thought was, could you wait and not screw this up? I'm retiring in about six months. <laughs> Don't change anything. Just hang on until I'm out of here, right? <laughs> I just thought that was so funny because it is the human nature to think, oh, you're bringing me all these problems, but, but I'm going to be transferred in, in a couple of months. Let's, let's, let's just wait. You know, we get these cultures then that develop that repetition of, uh, don't bring the boss to the problem or just, you know, hang on, paper it over. Somebody else will fix it. And, and those are the cultures that have a really difficult time at creating distinction. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The, whoever, you know, says that sweeping it under the rug is a good technique, <laughs> you know, that's, that's terrible. It always blows up. So you mentioned something and I just got to I just want to soak this in vicariously through you. Right. You, you probably like I did grew up you know, listening to Zig Ziglar oh, and yeah. watching the greats, right? The Dale Carnegie's right. of the world and, and, uh, and all these amazing people. And they would talk about how they would share the stage with each other. And then all of a sudden, fast forward a couple of decades, and now you're sharing the stage with these guys. Arnold Schwarzenegger called you up and invited you to speak at the White House with the president in the audience. What? <laughs> right? Can you walk me through what that was like? to get a call and to go to the White House and to have that experience, because that is mind-blowing. Well, and congratulations. I, I, well, thank you. I, I was given a speech in Indianapolis, and it, it was a group that uh, my late wife, uh, she worked with uh, an organization that the person that she was working with was part of this. And so because of that, you know, they asked me would I come uh, speak and MC at this meeting. And I walk out and Arnold Schwarzenegger's on the front row. He had been a longtime member of this group back in his bodybuilding days. It was, it was a group for fitness and health. And uh, I was terrified. You know, you don't, you don't want to mess up with the Terminators in the front row, right? <laughs> and so, so after the speech, he, was, he could not have been nicer. He shook my hand and, and I, you know, I was just blown away. And uh, he said, someday we will work together. And I thought, well, isn't that? And that yeah, yeah, right. And a few months later, uh, the phone rings and uh, the, the wonderful woman who was working with me at the time said, uh, uh, there's someone on the phone and she says that uh, she's with Arnold Schwarzenegger's office and he'd like to talk to you. And uh, it, it was a really funny situation because I, I, I've got a buddy from FFA days who at that time was on Atlanta radio and was a morning radio personality and did impressions, oh. <laughs> including Arnold. Right, right. So I just knew... You know, this, this could not have been, and so I'm just, ha, 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 you know, laughing along like we're old buddies and, right, right. and everything. And then he asked me to give the speech and I quoted my fee and, uh, uh, there was like this long pause and he said, well, every, you know, everyone else is donating their time. I just assumed, you know, to be at the white house and all this, you, you donate your, your fee and knowing this was my buddy. I said, Hey, this is what I do for a living. Did you do your last movie for nothing? What do you want? 
<laughs> and there was this long pause. And then he just he burst into laughter and he said, you know, you're exactly right. Uh, I'm, I'm asking you to do what you do for a living. Everybody else makes their money elsewhere. He said, we'll, we'll, we'll take care of that fee. And then he said something that made me, he referred the, to the person that was with my wife's company, who my friend wouldn't, I mean, my friend knew that I'd met Arnold, but oh, no. he, there was no way my friend, so now all of a sudden I realized I've told Arnold Schwarzenegger, <laughs> hey, you know, and uh, the, the funny thing was, so when I landed in, in Washington for the event, um, the, the woman that worked for Arnold came up, introduced herself, and I, I, the first thing I said is, oh my gosh, I told her the story, and I said, I would never speak to him that way. I, and she said, you promised me you'll never tell him that. She said he <laughs> thought that was the coolest thing because nobody stands up to him. And yeah. he just thought you were so cool because you'd stand up to him, you know, and not take any, any of his stuff. And I said, I wouldn't have if I didn't know it was him. I thought I was my friend, you know. And uh, the, the fast forward, the, the funny thing is, you know, after my wife passed and a, few, a while later I got remarried. And so I've told Tammy, my wife now, that story and I was speaking at the Beverly Hills Hotel and we walk out and uh, this limo pulls up and Arnold gets out and she's elbowing me and, I, and I'm just standing there and he starts to walk by and then he stopped and he turned around and said what are you doing here <laughs> are you supposed to be in Indiana you know and came up and, and talked to us it was just so oh, exciting it's amazing he, wow. he was just a, a wonderful wonderful person so uh, wow I know, I know he certainly had his personal challenges but he's accepted responsibility for those and and continues to move on and, and do very well and he uh, he's he's a remarkable i mean you, you know you think about his life we talk about individuals of distinction yeah you know he, he grew up in a poor family in austria and at the age of 15 set a goal to be the greatest bodybuilder in the history of the world uh, to improve the health of the world to marry an attractive woman from a highly respected family and to make movies wow now that's that's a heck that's a heck of a life, and uh, it, it, when you think about what he came from, his mother was along on the trip uh, that that we were at in, in Washington those years ago, uh -huh. and uh, you, you think about his humble beginnings and what he's achieved. Uh, no matter how you slice it, it's it's a pretty amazing life, and it and it talks about the 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 unbelievable potential of a human being, you know, yeah. the, the, what that what we can do and what we can accomplish. Uh, it's mostly governed by the boundaries we set for ourselves, not, mm -hmm. not what society or culture or others put upon us. Yeah. Well, that's exactly right. You know, a lot of times we just think too small Yeah. and uh, because of the amount of insecurity and, and all the excuses that we have, and it just keeps us from taking those chances. I mean, you here we are talking about the successes that you've had, right? But we started off talking about, you know, some pretty devastating circumstances with your late wife and then not your business, not going anywhere. And I mean, I don't even know how, how did you, what did you have to do? And I mean, we have to all survive and go on, but was there something that you found that helped pull you through uh, to start getting going again after your wife passed that, you know, how did, how did you uh, put the pieces back together? Uh, creditors calling was a really, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. really motivating uh, factor. Um, you know, to, to Sherry, Sherry was my late wife, uh, to her everlasting credit, part of what she said to me uh, was, uh, thank goodness for cancer. And I, I didn't know what she meant by that. And she said, we've had the opportunity to grieve together through this process. And so when I'm gone, now, now you can't sit around. You know, we grieve together. Uh, it's not like you lost me in a plane crash or a car wreck that was so unexpected. So wow. you've got to get on with your life. And, and knowing that that's what she wanted was a really uh, uh, motivating factor for me. Um, the other thing is, I, I, I think one of the things that I've, I learned is that, you know, I, I'm, I'm not trying to be a, a minister here or anything, but, you know, there, there, there is the saying that to whom much is given, much is expected. And the, the privilege that I have had uh, to be able to communicate uh, the privilege, the blessing that's been granted to be able to connect. Uh, if, if all I did was sit around and mope, then I was throwing away the gifts that, that I'd been given. And I, I just found that to be intolerable. So, you know, gosh, it, it, I, I think one of the challenges in our social media world is we see the pictures on Instagram and Facebook, and we read the accomplishments on LinkedIn and Twitter. 
and, and we think that everything's great. And everybody's life has significant challenges. Yeah. And the other thing that I learned is pain is pain. Is pain. Uh, by that, I mean what, what, what might seem trivial pain to someone else uh, could be devastating pain to another. Uh, we, we can't evaluate the depths of someone else's pain. And, and so all that we can do is to be encouragers, to try to help them and, and, and hope for them. And, I, and Tim, I tell you, that's, that's the other great thing that I had is I had great friends who were so willing to, uh, you know, to help, to, to encourage at, at the time I needed it most. And a side story on that, um, I, I got invited to speak uh, several years ago at the National FFA Convention, and it's when Sherry was still alive and and so we go, and I'm just building my speaking career at the time. And FFA was kind enough to ask me to come back and, and speak to the convention. For those that don't know, it's, it's one of the largest conventions in the world. You know, it's, there's 20,000 plus in the audience when you speak, and, and it's, it's just an amazing event. And, and Zig FFA, Ziglar was the other speaker yeah, that year. FFA, tell them what that stands for. Oh, it, it used to stand for Future Farmers of America. But what happened is, as the transition happened between production agriculture, farming, and agribusiness, in other words, the distribution and the process, all of that of food, and also things like small animal care, the veterinary offices in, in urban areas, uh, greenhouses, all that. It, it, they just went with the words or with the, with, the, with the letters FFA. So it doesn't technically stand for future farmers anymore. It's, it's to recognize the broad diversity of the agribusiness industry. But um, at that time, it was still future farmers. And, and um, so Zig was the other speaker. And Sherry and I check in the hotel and there's a message and it said, Mr. Ziegler wanted to know if you'd like to go to dinner tonight. Now, I'm a little league shortstop and Derek Jeter has just asked me if I want to go get a Coke. You know, I mean, it's just, <laughs> I was so over, I, I just, I couldn't believe it, right? And uh, we, had a, we had a fascinating, uh, he was just everything that you would hope he would be. So fast forward, uh, you know, 10 years or more and Sherry passes away. And I'm in the house. The, the hardest thing is a couple weeks later after the funeral's over and everybody goes home, gets back to their life and you're in the same house by yourself. And I, I'll never forget walking to the mailbox and there was a package there. It said Ziegler Corporation. And I said, oh, you know, my, my thought was one of my buddies has ordered me a, a book from Zig, you know, and I opened it up and there was an eight page handwritten letter from Zig wow. talking about how he and his wife had lost a child and just the pain that you go through to lose a family member. And I I've got friends I've known my whole life that didn't even send a sympathy card and Zig Ziglar sat down and wrote. And, and what I found out when Zig passed, I, I did a video and, and did a thing about that as a tribute to Zig. And I heard from so many people that he'd done the same thing. Hmm. It was special, but it wasn't unique. If, if that makes sense. Right. I mean, sure. that was just, and it, it gave me so much admiration for him but also so much gratitude that the person that I admired so much in this business walked their talk. Yes. You know? Yeah. Wow. So that's the third story in a row that's given me just chills. <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> I can see why people love you so much. So oh, you're so kind. Thank you. that is just, wow. Wow. These are really powerful stories. So I had the chance, uh, my wife and I met Zig once. It was just oh, very wow. brief. Yeah. Uh, but I shook his hand and, and he asked me what I was trying to do. And, and then he looked over at my wife and he said, son, you've already won. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> that's great. Always, that was the best thing I ever heard. Right. And so, oh, that's fantastic. You know, I had that picture of him and I, you know, together yeah. smiling and I treasure it. And, uh, and, but he was one of those people that really is, you know, I got to tell you, and I'm, I'm sure you've had this experience too. I've met a lot of people who, who, you know, just on film look like they really have it all together and then you meet them and it's like oh my god your life's a train wreck <laughs> like how are you so successful i don't even understand this yeah. and so uh but then there's a few right that really are just you know tried and true just really amazing people and so uh so zig's one of them and now after listening to you you are as well so it's really amazing. Well, I don't know. Yeah, talk to my wife. There's a few things that she. Sammy will be like, "Well, I, I yeah. got a, I got a short list." Of... Pajamas last night, you know. 
<laughs> Let me tell you about this train wreck I'm married to. I mean, we, yeah. we all have that in our lives. But, but you know, Tim, for, for many years, I, when I was building my speaking business, I had the greatest side hustle, you know, as they call it now. I had the greatest part-time gig in the world. Uh, I did movie reviews there for the CBS affiliate uh, Channel 8 in Indianapolis for many years. Yeah. So I got to go in these junkets where I'd interview celebrities and, and that for their movies. Yeah. I, the deal was I could ask them a question that I could use their answer in my speech is, you know, like how about success or about a, a personal development, that kind of stuff. And uh, to, to your point, there were some that were, you, you thought, how in the world did you ever, you know, even get a, a job? But then there were the others, and, and the ones that jumped out to me were Meryl Streep, whose who's, uh, husband is from Indiana, by the way, from Indianapolis. Oh. Um, she was amazing. Tom Hanks was incredible. John Travolta was incredible. I mean, I, I, I said forever that, that, that those three, if, if they would have desired to be the, you know, the CEO of General Motors, they would have made it. They would have been successful, whatever they did. But there were others that were kind of the you know, the A minus stars or the B plus stars that were rude and condescending yeah. and jealous of those at the top, not seeing that that jealousy and that rudeness is in part what kept them from getting to the top. And uh, to, to, to your point, uh, it's a great one, is that, uh, you know, it just seems like the folks who have done well, in many, many cases, you can go, oh, I get, I get that. Right. I, 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 I understand uh, why, why that happened the way it did. Yeah. Well, those are one of those ex distinctions, right? Yeah, so envy exactly. is one of the seven deadly sins and, uh, and it is, you know, it's a good one. <laughs> it can really make you feel jealous when you see other people that are taking off and you're like, what's wrong with uh, me. Right? right. And, and, uh, yeah. yeah. And I've, I've always said that's the difference and I, I don't know that I'm defining it properly, but in, in, in my heart, I've always said there's a difference between envy and jealousy. Uh, envy is you have something and man, I really admire that. And I'd like to have that too. I'm envious of your success. I'd like to have it too. To me, jealousy is I want it instead of you. Yeah. And, and that's the one that I think is, is so damning and, and so difficult because it not only means I want what you've got, it means I don't want you to have what you've got. I want it instead of you. And sometimes, you know, that that's the challenge. I mean, when, when I looked at a Tony Robbins or a Zig Ziglar, you know, gosh, did I, did I envy their success, but it didn't mean that I wanted it instead of them. Right. And I think when we have that attitude, we can approach it, we can approach the situation and, and feel better about it uh, and also learn. But, but there you go again, uh, part of distinction uh, and I'd suggest uh, you probably agree part of being mesmerizing as well is that you find your own path. You learn from others, but you don't imitate others. Uh, an Elvis impersonator will never reach the heights of Elvis. Right? I mean, uh, the, the copy is never as good as the original. And, and so if, if we're going to become mesmerizing and if we're going to attain distinction, it's, it's gonna happen in part because we learn from others, but we create our own unique path. Yes. Yeah, if somebody says, I want to be Scott McCain, and th the answer is we already have one, and he's awesome, right? You need to well, be the best you that you can be. Just yeah. take it. <laughs> but, so, right. you, you, uh, another quick story. My, my, uh, a mentor of mine, and, and his name won't ring a bell to most, his name was Grady Nutt, N-U-T-T. -T. That, that was his real name, and he was a uh, former minister, became a humorist. He, he, uh, strangely enough, he was a regular for many years on, on the old show Hee Haw, but he was, he wasn't, he, he, they had like a minute and a half where he'd tell a story by himself, you know, and not uh, all the, the, the corny stuff that went on there. Was just such a wonderful man. Sherry and I were married in his living room, literally married at the nut house. I mean, he was, he was an amazing, amazing humorist and speaker uh, who sadly was killed in a plane crash coming home from an event. But uh, I wanted to be Grady. I wanted to sound like Grady. I wanted to tell stories like Grady. And I, one of the most fortunate things that happened to me was Grady took me out to lunch and he said, I am so honored that you respect me and look up to me and, and view me as a mentor. But he said, if you're trying to be the next Grady nut, the best you can hope for is second place. Mm. He said, I have a corner on the Grady nut market. <laughs> but he said, nobody can be the best Scott McCain like you can. And, you're, yeah. and, and it was 
I, I, talk about, I got goosebumps telling you the story because it was one of those, you know, there's certain moments in life that, that, that really help you, you look back and you see where it charts a direction. And, and that was the time that I, I really understood that you, you, you can't be an impersonator. You can't be an imitator. You have to chart your own course, even though you might admire somebody's work so much that, you know, you, in your, in your drive to be successful, that you try to take on their qualities. You, you can't do that, but you got a corner on the market of being the best you that you can be. Yeah, absolutely. I remember a story that really struck me. Um, it was just about this, these two brothers and they were really close, but one of them found this lamp. And uh, so he could wish for whatever he want, but the genie said that whatever you get, your brother gets twice as much. And so over time it was fun. I get a million dollars. He gets $2 million, right? I get a wife. He gets two wives. I get a house. He gets two houses. Right. And so then all of a sudden the jealousy kicked in. And, uh, and so the last thing he wished for was to be blind in one eye. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> and I know. And that little, ugh, that little gut check oh. of a story is like, wow. Cause that's oh. ultimately where it takes you to, right? It, it never, it never takes you to a, a happy, peaceful, successful place. Right. Yeah. So even if you end up with the with the material things that you think were going to make you happy, the collateral damage that's left in the wake of trying to get that stuff yeah. ends up not being worth the price. So, so, such a good story. You're so yeah. right, Tim. That's yeah. So I know people can go on Amazon and get iconic and get your other books. Is, is there another place that uh, that we can direct people to so they can learn more about you and your work? And oh gosh, I appreciate you asking. We we have a part of what I want to do is is get this information out there. So we created a a, a website called DistinctionNation.com, nice. and people sign up and it's absolutely free. You can download eBooks, workbooks on how to create distinction. I have a free 14 day audio program on what it takes to create personal distinction. It's, it's, there's, you know, there's nothing on there that you have to buy. It's absolutely free. Just go sign up for distinction nation and you can download those resources free. I have a daily podcast. I, I do like a five to 10 minute daily podcast on an idea. Of what does it take to stand out or do better? And it's just project distinct. And you can find it just as you find this on, on all the outlets. I'm not on YouTube <laughs> with that. It's probably should be, but uh, it's Project Distinct and it's, it's anywhere that you listen to podcasts. It's available. ScottMcCain.com is the, uh, the, the main website that tells you all about the speaking and blog and everything else. So there's several ways. We're, we're trying to surround people. You can't escape it, even if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm on social media too. If anybody wants to connect on social media, I, I, I do all my own social media because I, I think that we, we often uh, hear the media word, but we don't hear the social word and social yeah. media, you interact and you connect. Yeah. So I, I do all my own social media. So uh, if anybody wants to connect that way, I'd, I'd be privileged to hear from them. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. We're going to have all these links in the show notes. So everybody that's listening, as soon as we're done, you definitely got to head over to distinctionnation.com. And uh, check out that 14-day audio program because that's amazing that Scott's just giving it away. And then uh, scottmccain.com, uh, you know, bring them to your events and, uh, and make sure you share them with everybody that books events because, uh, I mean, you've got a sample of uh, just a, a taste of what he brings to the table. And then finally, um, the Project Distinct podcast. I'm going to sign up for that today. Oh, thanks. I appreciate very that. Very exciting. Yeah, I would love to. Well, see you know, we, we, we talked about some of the motivational folks uh, that has inspired us. When, when I was a kid working at the little radio station in Scottsburg, Indiana, mm -hmm. uh, they had a program called Our Changing World. And I had to play it every day that I worked. And it was by Earl Nightingale. Oh, yeah. And it was just a five minute, you know, here's an idea of the day of what you can do to be better in life. And it was, I really influenced me. And so, you know, that's why I try to do something a little distinctive, I get it, with the podcast. And I just do a little daily, you know, five to 10 minute, just an idea of the day. And the fun thing is I hear from people that listen to it every day, or I hear from people that, you know, download it, and then we'll have a drive on the weekend. So they listen to the entire week at once. But uh, it's, it's been a lot of fun to do. And I, I really enjoy doing it. Oh, that's outstanding. So two more questions for you, because I know your sure. time's valuable. So based on all the things that you've learned, if you could go back and tell 10 year old Scott some, give him some nuggets of advice about how to, you know, what to do moving forward. What would you go back and tell that little boy that you once were? What a great question. Um, I, I think I would say 
that life is a roller coaster and to be prepared for the ups and the downs and to also realize that the ups can be higher than you ever imagine. Mm. Because I think so many times we are, we have our blinders on, you know, that, that this is what, and sadly, I, I, hopefully it's changing, but sadly, I think that's part of what, what we put young people through uh, as they go through school or as they enter college, you're going to get on the academic track or you're going to get on this track and choose your major and, and all of that. And you know, I'm, I'm in a job now. I never thought in high school, I didn't even know there was such a thing as a professional speaker. I mean, I knew there were authors, but I didn't know there were speakers. And, and um, it, it, life can take you so many wonderful and incredible places as long as in, in the movie Parenthood by uh, uh, Ron Howard, they make the roller coaster analogy that some people, you know, squeeze the bar and close their eyes and just wait for it to be over. And some people throw back their head and laugh and enjoy the ride. And uh, that would be, that would be the advice is to don't hold the bar too tightly and squint your eyes closed, you know, enjoy the ups, enjoy the downs, even though they're challenging and uh, enjoy the ride. Mm, that's really good. Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, the legendary Scott McCain <laughs> making his distinctions right here on how to be mesmerizing. That's amazing. Scott, thank Thanks. you so much for the ride. I mean, this was just wonderful. I love the stories and they were heartfelt and touching and, and uh, inspiring. And I just feel like I've been on a roller coaster. I need to go take a nap now or something. I don't <laughs> <laughs> it was so good. So I really appreciate oh, you best. being here. Thank you. What a privilege. Thank you for having me. And I look forward to talking again soon. Yes, thank you so much. All right, everybody. Well, that's my interview with Scott McCain. Pretty amazing guy, huh? So I hope that you go back and you really dig into the lessons that he shared and, and those golden nuggets that he gave you because um, understanding with clarity who you are, how you stand out from the crowd, and what makes you uh, amazing and mesmerizing is where it's all at. Make sure that you check out all of, of Scott's programs, his book, his podcast, his free audio program. Uh, you know, and then uh, make sure you sign up for his social media stuff too, because he just has so much to offer. And uh, as always, I really appreciate you being a part of this experience. And uh, if it wasn't for you, then this show just wouldn't matter that much. So thanks for being here and thanks for being amazing. Now go out there, apply what you've learned from Scott and make today a sure success. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks everybody. Hey, would you like more free tips on how to be a mesmerizing leader? Then check out mesmerizingleadership.com and also hang out with me on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash Tim Schur. Thanks so much and make you.